Okay, back from one more page. <clears throat> Here we got page six of the section 2.3 notes. Um, <clears throat> my voice is still <clears throat> hanging in there. Okay, so now you're asked, let's use the integrated value theorem to show that this equation, so it's kind of this um, interesting um, cubic function, has at least one solution. So if you were to solve x equals x cubed minus two, that was just really hard to do analytically. I think you'd have to do it graphically. We're asked to use the integrated value theorem to help, to help you verify that this does have at least one solution. Now, what you could do is rewrite the equations as, as your first step. So if I rewrite it, what if I just track the x from both sides? So you deliberately get zero on one side of the equation. And so you can think of this as um, a function that's polynomial in nature. We'll call it g of x. Now, if you were to graph this, if you graph the Desmos or your calculator, I presume it's going to look something, I know it's wider step than a two. Uh, if I plug one in, for example, if I make a little table here, plug zero, I get negative two. Plug a one, I think I also get negative two. It's kind of interesting. Um, if I plug in two, that's going to get a little high. I think it's going to be four. Uh, if I plug in three, it looks like it'll get even higher. Uh, 27 minus five, just 22. It looks like it will just keep increasing. <laughs> if I plug in like negative one, I think I get, um, what do I get? Do I get negative two again? I guess I do. Weird. Um, Okay, <laughs> well, I'm pretty sure if I plug in negative two, I get negative eight here, minus negative two. Um, yeah, I think it'll be negative eight altogether. So basically, your graph kind of looks like this. Like that, right? Notice how I have this cross on the x-axis somewhere between one and two, right? Because remember, at x equals one, y was negative. At x equals two, y was positive. And what are we trying to do here? Remember, this is our equation. We simply rewrote it by moving x on one side, totally fair to do. And then I deliberately let the right side, the non-zero side of my equation, uh, set it as a function, which is totally fine. Say, hey, g of x equals this, cool. Well, obviously, g of x equals zero. <laughs> and that's what I'm really asking you to do now. I've, I've actually changed what the question is asking. <clears throat> Not dramatically, but I just express it a little differently, right? Really, what I'm asking you to do is, hey, show me that g of x, which is now x cubed minus x minus 2, has at least one solution. So like, g of x can equal zero at least once. That's what you're really trying to say here. Can g of x equals zero because remember, by moving x to the other side, the expression now equals zero, and we're saying this expression equal to g of x. Can g of x equal zero at least once? Well, if I look at the graph, of course it does. Over here. I don't know what it is exactly, but all we have to do is we have to use the intermediate value theorem to verify that this can happen. Can this equal zero at least once? That's what IVT is all about. So you must establish the fact that g of x is continuous in some carefully selected closed interval, picking x values that yield one negative y value and one positive y value. I did that over here. So it helps to, um, again, rewrite the equation, plug in some values, or use a little intuition and say, well, if I plug in this x value, y is negative, plug in this x value, y is positive. So that's what I did. So step three, actually, I kind of did prior to steps one and two in a way um, where I wanted to um, find that. So obviously, we'll let um, a equal one. So g of a, of course, is 
negative 2. Let B, remember we talked about A and B in the um, theorem, A being the left um, endpoint of your interval, B being the right endpoint of your interval. And B is 2, so G of 2, or G of B, equals 4. Now, is this continuous um, on all real numbers? Well, of course, it's a polynomial function. And, um, well, since this is continuous for all real numbers, <laughs> right? Uh, of course, it's going to be continuous from 1 to 2. We know that. Um, so, therefore, g of 1, and we know g of 1 is less than 0, and we know g of 2 is greater than 0. So, this is the, the, the big step. Um, and I'm not going to move my screen because I don't want to... Um, remove all the stuff I have here. Um, so your evidence is all this right here. Um, so what you could say is that because g of x is continuous on one to two, and that g of one equals negative two, and g of two equals four, then by IVT, there will be an x value in 1 comma 2 for which g of x equals 0. Hence, g of x equals 0 has at least one solution. So it's a lot of writing. And you do have to state by IVT that, you know, that you're quoting it. So the things I care most about, usually I grace is a three-point problem. You got to say this, you got to quote this, and you got to show me this. The rest is all semantics at this point. And you can write it in kind of a few different ways, but you have to tell me the assumption continuous. You've got to give me an interval. We got above and below. You got to quote the IVT. So that's what's happening there. And of course, you're saying, yeah, there will be blah, 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 whatever. I mean, that's what I'm asking you to do. Um, so, in essence, um, I kind of done step four where I put the um, interval. Um, g of 1 is less than 0, which is less than g of 2. I am going to clear a screen. Um, and when you apply the IVT, um, obviously, um, we're showing that uh, you know, g of negative 1 is um, less than 0. Oh, sorry, g of 1. My bad. And I hope I didn't say negative. Well, let me just undo so many things here. Yeah, I didn't say G of negative 1. Sorry. You could have done negative 1 if you wanted to. Um, the filled out notes has negative 1 for the far left interval. But as long as you choose two x values where the y value for the far left, the y value for the far right are in between, I'm sorry, are above and below uh, y equals 0, you're fine. Um, and then, of course, we state our answer. Um, <clears throat> In general, when applying IVT, you must write the continuity statement. State, you know, these intervals here, right? Um, or that, um, you know, state what you know, f of a was and what f of b was, and then quote it. So it's those three things, again. You got to tell me about continuity. 
You got to tell me about, you know, what your uh, F of A and F of B values are, and you got to quote it. So that's that. Now a chance to do homework.